everybody needs an advocate. Because I'm not there 24-7. Families that have hemophilia mature faster. I've been feeling a lot of anxiety lately. I'm so tired of being strong. To understand how far we've come helps you appreciate where we are now. No is just no for this person. Somebody's going to say yes sooner or later. And it helps you understand that there are more steps to be taken in the future. You're the first person I've met with a bleeding disorder. Let's fight the disease and not the people who have it. Uh, so we have three exceptional panelists today, two who are part of the Hemophilia B community and then one guest panelist to share their perspective on obstacles, challenges, and what it takes to overcome. So with that, we're going to start with our first panelist. He is uh, an 18-year-old high school senior from Brunswick, Georgia, who is also the uh, William Drowen, did I say that correctly? Yes, sir. Uh, Hemophilia, Coalition of Hemophilia B scholarship recipient, and will be going off to college in the fall to study IT. We have C.Y. Harrington. Hello, C.Y. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. Congrats on your scholarship. Yeah. You, got, you took an interest in IT and computers very early on. I think you told me you had built your own at 15. Yes, sir. Built your own computer, which I literally have no idea what that even means. Like, I don't know where you would start. But we talked about how growing up with hemophilia being a bit limited with physical activity. I'm curious, do you think that that played a role in your finding IT or did you make a conscious choice that uh, computers and, and gaming and some of these activities just might be better uh, uses of your time? Well, I feel like it was honestly a mix of both. Um, just growing up with hemophilia, I had several bleeds. I had a really, really active target joint. So I was always in the room with my eyes with an IV in my hand or something like that. And I was always at um, either on the phone or on my computer and I just started to be, become interested in how that computer or the phone worked. Um, but I honestly just found it, it almost like it, it felt like it came naturally, so. Hmm. You had mentioned uh, uh, challenges with your, with your joint, with your right knee and the bleeds in there and you have an inhibitor as well, right? Yes, sir. Um, and can you give us a little overview? How has the inhibitor played a role in your life? Well, I actually um, became desensitized to my inhibitor uh, probably around 2016. So it's not, it's not as active and it didn't really play much of a role in, in how I lived life. But Since 2016? Yes. Okay. But, but then again, you know, it, it just seemed, it, it affected me also because of um, my increased bleeds in my right knee. Sure. Yeah, so tell us a bit about your knee. I mean, we can see here that you have uh, a prosthetic, so you've gotten an amputation on the leg. Um, when did you start having, wh when was that identified as your target joint? Do you remember when that was kind of labeled as your target joint? I don't remember when it was labeled, but it was, it was, it was a joint that was always actively bleeding. Um, so I say, Probably around seven years old, I just kept getting knee bleeds, like repeated knee bleeds. Um, and some of, them, some of them were even spontaneous, because some of my bleeds, you know, I, sometimes I know what I did, or um, if I hit it, or if I just walked too long or something, but, mo but some of them were spontaneous. So with that, it just became my target joint, and it got just repeated bleeds. And then at what point? Sorry? It was just my most active joint. Your most active joint, as far as bleeds go. And then at what point did you start talking at home and, and with doctors about the possibility of amputation and kind of the pros, cons, and risk benefits of that? Well, before, before that, um, I was uh, riding a bike, and I had fell off the bike, which resulted in my, in my, in my right knee bleeding again. And just getting the medicine was untimely and it resulted in my knee being uh, contracted for a couple years. So with that, over those years, I had several uh, surgeries, um, synovectomies on my right knee in order to, in an attempt to fix it, that way I could flex it, bend it, and you know, get back to normal. But it just wouldn't, it would never straighten out after those three surgeries. But my fourth surgery, um, in the attempt to straighten it out again, uh, when they when the surgeon did straighten it out, my arteries and uh, blood vessels become like noodles, and it cut off the circulation of my foot, which resulted in the option for amputation. But talking with the doctors, um, it was tough just to know that I had to I'm about to face a big change in my life with the um, 
amputation. So then thinking, I guess that's also something going into college this fall, in addition to the hemophilia, there's some maybe some accessibility or other considerations that you have to account for. Um, how are you going about setting yourself up for college? So we started talking about that in the beginning. How are you starting to uh, have those conversations with various departments or offices about your living situation, about hemophilia, about what you need? What, what, what are those conversations that you're having? Oh, well, I'm definitely in contact with the disability services at, the, at my college of choice. Um, and just talking with them about if I could get a refrigerator in my room, like for my medicine, um, accommodating for housing, having a first floor room, um, and just being able to have all those uh, privileges from my high school, like uh, leaving class early, um, being notified if a fire drill uh, is about to happen, or just being ahead of whatever I may have to, I may have to do in that act in college. Um, with that, it's, it's coming along pretty, pretty well. Um, I just have to make sure that I take on more responsibility for my hemophilia. Um, just knowing when I take my medicine, knowing how much medicine I take, uh, I take knowing how to mix it, just different little things that I have to improve on. Even ordering my medicine, I have to improve on it. So just so I can be on top of it and ahead for when or if I get a bleed. Well, I mean, your awareness of it, of what you need to improve on and where you need to go is tremendous because that's, that's half the battle is just knowing what you need to do. Um, there was actually a powering through conversation where there was a guy reflecting on when he first went to college and he had done a lot of his due diligence, but he had let a couple things slip. And one of those things uh, was when he was getting his, his first shipment from his pharmacy to his dorm, it arrived and was just sent to the mailroom, which okay, that's maybe not the best place for it, but okay. But it arrived at a Friday while he was in class, and by the time he got out of class, it was the weekend, the mailroom was closed, and the following week was a holiday week, so it was gonna be closed for nine days with his medicine inaccessible to him. Now, of course, he was able to make the appropriate phone calls and change that, but it was a, it was a nuisance at the very least, and had he had something scheduled for that Friday night, a flight home for the break or anything, that would have all had to have shifted um, to accommodate a uh, avoidable problem. So there's just kind of those like little things that you know don't seem as profound as learning to self-infuse or other aspects of gaining independence, but if you don't take care of them, they can present these really annoying problems. Um, but it sounds like you're aware of all that, which is, which is half the battle. I wanna to talk to you about one other thing, and then we're gonna invite Charity up here as well, and that is your experience at camp. You spoke to me on the phone uh, uh, very positively about your experience going to Camp One O'Clock um, and what you learned there with regard to how did you put it um, uh, independence and uh, self-reliance. Uh, so tell me and share with people maybe newly diagnosed families who will watch this who are hearing about camp, maybe thinking about their kid going to camp when they're six, seven, eight years old. What? How did camp help you with your independence? Camp it just teaches you how to do stuff on your own. Uh, just sort of stuff like um, creating arts and crafts or just being able to uh, infuse yourself. That's a really big thing at camp. Um, camp also helped me socially, like how to talk to people, how to make friends. It helped me in ways of like just being more active also. You know, having that mentality of I can do this um, without anybody's help. You know, just being that one independent person. Um, and also camp has that fun aspect of it where you do all this stuff that other people say that you might cannot do, like archery or horseback riding. You know, it's just small things like that, um, that they teach you how to do it yourself and how to do it safely and just be yourself. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. Uh, CY Harrington, everybody. Thank you, CY. And, uh, so I our next panelist, uh, she is a, a mom of three boys. Her oldest and youngest have uh, severe factor IX deficiency, hemophilia B, uh, and she's from Springfield, Missouri. Please welcome Charity Meadows. Hi, Charity. Uh, my oldest should be taking notes because Siren is on top of it, so. You are? I yeah. You're a role model. Yeah, You're just gonna have you to are. accept that in life. <laughs> uh, so Charity, um, 
so you mentioned you have three sons, two with hemophilia B, no family history. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about kind of a, a nuance in your story, which I find interesting. I'm always interested in diagnoses with families that have no prior family history. Um, but with Elijah, your oldest, it was relatively, we'll say, normal, smooth-ish, as smooth as the yeah. diagnosis of hemophilia with no family history can be. Yeah. Um, your middle son, Aiden, unaffected. Mm -hmm. Your youngest son, you said um, that with, with Evan, it was, it was a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. So, simple question, why? Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, I guess as far as like diagnosis goes, um, of course, Elijah was a shock, but looking back now, it was, it was easy compared to the second one. Um, when Evan was diagnosed, um, he was actually tested like twice and they told us he didn't have it and that it could have been a vitamin K deficiency. And these were the doctors that diagnosed him, diagnosed my first son. So um, it was about, ten, he was about 10 months old when he finally got the diagnosis that he actually did have hemophilia B and we ended up going to a completely different doctor to get that diagnosis. So, um, and then um, a year and a half ago, he was just diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So um, we kind of have two major chronic illnesses to deal with. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting experience trying to find a new normal, I guess. Sure. Yeah. So the time between Evan's diagnosis with hemophilia and the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, would you say that that time in between was that relatively, because you had said to me, you know, we felt like we had, we knew hemophilia, we had that kind of under our belt. So was there a sense of stability and kind of consistent management for that period of time? Yeah, I mean, I felt like we were, you know, everything was going smooth as could be, you know, we were on an infusion schedule and I mean, sure things would pop up and we'd have to give an extra infusion here and there, but yeah, I felt like we were pros. I mean, we were, you know, Life, life was going well, so yeah. And then how does that curveball of, here's another condition, what, what did that, I mean, I guess there's so many, you know, there's new doctors, there's new insurance challenges, there's just new appointments in the schedule and you have to balance that against work life and other family responsibility, but what were some of the most pronounced challenges once this new diagnosis was introduced? Um, the biggest, of course, was, you know, this poor little kid who all of our little boys and girls, you know, have to get this you know, twice a week, three times a week, infusions has now, it, it's gone from that to seven shots a day, you know, before, before meals, when his blood sugar's high. Um, so it was just almost like, I, 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 didn't, I didn't even know how to, to even approach it to make it like easy for him at all, you know? I and think you had mentioned to me something between all the different factor and then the different shots for diabetes. It's just like constantly doing math. Yes. It's <laughs> like there's numbers in my head all the time. And I hated math. I was like, oh, get me out of this class. Um, but yeah, it's just like, that's all I do now is just like, there's constant numbers just running through my head. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. On the insurance front, did you face any new challenges with once this the, the diabetes diagnosis was there as well we really didn't um which is kind of what is your secret <laughs> I, how I know, probably just night being naive i don't know playing dumb i guess um we really he was diagnosed and you know then you know all of a sudden the doctors are like okay we got to do this and this and this and this and we're like okay and you kind of you're sitting there waiting for the bill okay great you know what's it going to be but the hemophilia you know you meet your copay within the first month two months you know with your insurance um and he was diagnosed in september so you know everything was pretty much going to be paid for thank goodness um so so far thank goodness we haven't had um i don't think we've really had any issues whatsoever because you know, now, now he's on a pump and we didn't have to worry about anything with that. A Dexcom that reads his blood sugars to us 24 seven. So yeah, I really don't know what the secret is. It's just, hey, I don't know. I mean, it, it, with that, if it ain't broke, don't <laughs> fix know, it. Right? Yeah. Just so super like, curious just, and yeah. we're gonna move right along okay. though. I don't wanna jinx that whatsoever. Um, 
so we've talked a little about Elijah, your, your oldest son, and, and, and Evan, your youngest. But when I asked you about what's been the biggest challenge with all this, just thinking about obstacles and challenges, you had said keeping the whole family involved. And with Aiden, your middle son, um, that he's the one that you worry about the most. Uh, can you speak to that a little more? First of all, having an odd number amount of children, three, five, or whatever, you're always going to have a couple gang up on one. Or, yeah, you, you know, can't play one-on-one -on -one defense. Right, yeah, right, I gotta exactly. see why I bring it back to basketball <laughs> references. It all comes back to basketball <laughs> right. references. You're outnumbered now. You are, yeah. Um, so, you know, you've got the two with these conditions that are constantly having to be cared for in some kind of, you know, the infusion, or we got a dose for your meal, and um, you know, and then Aiden is just kind of there to the side. And, and um, when, when he was younger, we involved him with the infusions, like, you know, he'd be the Band-Aid holder. Or, That's a good job. Know, it is. It is. It's the most important job. <laughs> and um, you get to worrying about how, you know, is he getting enough attention? Are we paying enough attention to him just as much as we are the other two? We try to do one-on-one, -on -one, well, for me, I guess one-on-one -on -one date nights, but with him and dad, it's not a date night. It's, you know, going and hanging out and stuff. So we try to do that one-on-one -on -one with each of them so that hopefully they feel important. And, um, and yeah, so, and we try to involve them with, with Evan, with the new diagnosis too, because, and maybe it's too much, in, you know, involvement, you know, take care of your brother, watch your brother, or make sure your brother, you know, is feeling okay. Um, so yeah, it's a balancing act for sure. You know, even just having kids maybe without issues is a balancing act, but then you throw in hemophilia and then, um, and then type one and it's like, you feel like you're walking a tightrope every day to just try and keep it all together and moving, you know, forward, so yeah. One final topic and then we'll invite Nicole up and round out our group here. Um, regarding self-care, but not for your children, but for, for you and for your husband. How have you managed to make sure that you haven't forgotten yourselves through all this? Because it's, like you said, it's a tightrope walk, it's a lot to manage, mm -hmm. but then you're also just human beings yourself. Right. So how, ha and that is something, and I know we did one of these last week at, with the Nevada chapter, and there were two moms of uh, children with von Willebrand disease, both of whom spoke about uh, throwing themselves away a little bit and sacrificing themselves to unhealthy levels in the beginning. Ha have, have you guys had to navigate self-care in a new way over the last um, 15 years? I, yeah, I mean, you know, in the first, in the beginning, I feel like, you know, you just, you're just worried about the, your children and wanting to give them the best that you can. Um, so you kind of just forget that, you know, you're like, well, I don't have the time to exercise or you know, do things that you enjoyed before because you're a full-time, your full-time job is taking care of your children with, with hemophilia. But here, um, now that we feel like we've got things under control, um, it, it's definitely important for us as moms and dads to take care of ourselves so that we can then take care of our children. Um, and whether it's, for me, it's exercising. And, you know, for you, it may be just going and getting a coffee and, or quiet time to read or something, just to kind of recharge your own batteries so that you can then, you know, tackle the next, the next day, the next obstacle, you know, just to um, make sure that, you know, keep everyone healthy. Um, well, thank you, Charity. Thank yeah. you for sharing so openly. Charity Meadows, everybody. Um, with that, we'll play the, 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 the little game again. We do the little shuffle. Um, and the last obstacle course contestant, <laughs> Uh, she is an actress, comic, and advocate for people living with systemic onset juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. She's from Los Angeles, California, and her name is Nicole Dalton. There she is. Hi, Nicole. <laughs> so I always find it interesting with these panels, and those who've been to these before know, to, to bring someone in who is not a part of this community. Because um, I do think sometimes we can get a little bit myopic about our obstacles and challenges and forget that. And actually, I think John mentioned this in, the, in his presentation just before this, that hemophilia or otherwise, life is just full of stuff that you got to deal with. And I think when there are other people who have specific experiences of interest, um, that we can benefit from those as well. Uh, so, Nicole, that brings Hello. you here. Um, so that's a title, uh, Systemic Onset Juvenile Rheumatoid Arthritis. Um, so as an advocate, putting that hat on mm -hmm. for a second, can you give us the elevator pitch for what is systemic onset juvenile rheumatoid arthritis? Sure. I um, just want to say first, you're both amazing. Um, 
So uh, systemic juvenile rheumatoid arthritis is, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is when the body attacks, it's an autoimmune disease, it's when the body attacks all of your joints. Um, it thinks that your body is a disease. So you have joint inflammation, that's why my hands look the way they do. Um, it feels like you have the flu all of the time. And the systemic part is if you really want to be a winner, um, because that's the more uh, hardcore part of it. So the systemic means involving the whole body. So it affects your organs, uh, your digestive tract. Um, it's really for the committed amongst you. Yeah, if you yeah, really the... want to just dig your heels in and just be type A about it, <laughs> you go for the gold. Um, and you can get peri I got pericarditis, so you get uh, inflammation around your heart. Um, rash all over your body. Uh, there, it's just, there are so many other beautiful attributes. Those are just to name a few. And your temperature, I think I said, rises to 105 twice a day. So... Twice a day, like just generally, yeah, that's, that's to be expected? That's one of the that criteria to be diagnosed is um, twice a day, fevers rising twice a day to elevated levels, usually in the uh, afternoons and evenings. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, usually around 2 and 6 p.m. Oh, well, how are we doing? <laughs> uh, oh, uh, how was a half hour ago? <laughs> well, I got through it. Okay, wow. <laughs> Sitting right there, too, very calm. You're very good at this. You've been doing it for a little yeah, while, it's been huh? 27 years, so I've had it for a long time. I've been living in the labyrinth for a while. All right, well, I didn't mean to date you, but I was no, the next okay. thing I was about to say was so you were diagnosed at 13. Yeah. So, no, 27 it's okay. Years. 27 years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, diagnosed at 13. Um, so, I guess that's when these series of symptoms presented that mm -hmm. qualify for the diagnosis. Yes. Um, but when you mentioned that to me, it just immediately struck like that's entering high school age. Like oh, your body's yeah. already going through so many changes and socially there's mm -hmm. so much going on at that age mm -hmm. to then throw this diagnosis in on top of it. Yeah, like I, what was that experience like? So I was lucky in that my uh, diagnosis was uh, very quick because the onset was so aggressive. It was literally I woke up one day, I had swollen fingers, then the next a uh, couple days later I had rash all over my body and then the next week I had fevers right away. So I was put on prednisone, uh, I'm sure you guys know that's a steroid, and I started high school um, where I gained 20 pounds and some of my hair fell out on my head, some grew on my face, and that was how I started high school. Mm. And then I also got my period, so I just thought, oh, this is what becoming a woman is like. Um, <laughs> so that was a magical time. And, uh, yeah, it was... It was I, I would go to school with a rash on my face sometimes and limping one day and then not limping the other day at one day. It was, it was a, I call it mythic living because there is no manual for this and, and it, there, there's no narrative for it. So we're, we don't have any context for the way we're navigating chronic illness because it doesn't go away. So you're always habituating to a new normal. So it, it is you're living this, this, unlivable life sometimes. And how many others, uh, so yeah, give us a sense of um, how, how rare, how common, and then uh, systemic mm -hmm. versus other forms of, right. of rheumatoid arthritis. So there's juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, you can have polyarticular, that's involving uh, two or more joints. Um, juvenile, juvenile arthritis, and then the systemic juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, that's about one or two percent of the population. Um, yeah, so there are about 300,000 kids in the U.S. alone living with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, but there are all these subcategories. And then 1% to 2% of that 300,000 top Has number systemic. fall into your yeah. category. Okay, so that's not a very big population. No. So high school, college, young professional life, did you meet other people that had it? Were you connected to any kind of community? No. So, I, you know, I think, thank God, uh, Facebook wasn't around when I was in college. Um, <laughs> I'm really grateful for that. Uh, but uh, if it I, keeps up uh, its current behaviors, it's not going to be yeah, around that much that's longer. That's true. That's a whole other <laughs> panel. But I didn't. Um, my doctors had said there's a possibility that some kids uh, burn out of it. it. You, you, it will go away. So I always mm -hmm. kind of maintained that belief. I thought it would go away, and it was always. And the flares were horrible. They would, they really just take you. They take you down completely. Um, I would. Uh, 
my, I would have to miss school a lot, and my parents would bring me back uh, CDs of different musicals, and I would sing along to the whole musical, and that's how I got into theater. And um, I was doing a show in high school, because I was in a performing arts high school, and I had a flare-up at the show while we were doing it, and I had a fever, the whole thing, I was shaking, and my, I had this little pack of friends, and they would roll me up in a, a blanket after the show, like a, like a little burrito, and just put me over their shoulder, and carry me to the back of the car, lay me down, and then we'd go to Denny's, and I'd just kind of be sitting there. So, they, that's how I, in, certain ki kids or my peers embraced it, um, I, when I was in college, I was doing a production of Hair, and I had a terrible flare-up, and someone carried me home from uh, one, of the, one of the performances. I c could not walk. I could, I could not walk. It, is the, it, is, it feels like someone has taken a nail gun and shot it into your joints, and then you also have the worst flu of your life. And then my digestive tract got involved a few years ago and I had a portion of my intestines removed as well. Um, and so that's a whole, other, uh, a whole other comorbidity that you have to renegotiate, which I think is what you're talking about. It's like, okay, I got used to this uh, underworld and I know how to swim at the bottom of the well here, hmm. but now there's this, now the, the well's even deeper than I thought it was. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this life. So it's, it's still now, day by day, figuring out how, how I'm gonna do it all, because there's so many medications, and um, med compliance is so important, and I think there's a, such a stigma right now of Eastern versus Western medications when it's absolutely an integrative treatment model. Um, I cannot, I cannot preach enough how staying on a treatment that works for you, how important that is. Because um, uh, Enbrel, which is a TNF inhibitor, got me through college. Hmm. Uh, I would not have graduated, but I would really, you know, flare up and then go to my parents' house and then go back to school during break. But then you're in your adult life, there's no flaring up and going back to your parents' house and resuming your life. You're just right. in your life. Right, right. And, and with what you do as well, you know, as an actor, your, your body is your instrument. This mm -hmm. is what you work with. Yeah. And you, know, you had talked about, you're, I'm an extrovert. Yeah. You know, I, I recharge with people, I engage in life, but at times it feels as though uh, I'm dragging this body around. Mm -hmm. And when you said that, I was like, I get it. I, especially when I had an inhibitor when I was younger, mm -hmm. and we talked about that, you know, I was middle school age, yes. and five, seven, and 225 pounds, missing school all the time. Yeah. And, really struggling and it just feels like I, I all I want to do is engage life but mm -hmm. this is not cooperating mm -hmm. so how especially given what you are doing professionally how do you how do you negotiate that sometimes not well um, <laughs> if I, I, I can I can only be honest um, it's easy to remember <laughs> well well I you know I'm not feeling particularly, I got pneumonia twice this year, so I couldn't take my medications. So mm -hmm. I flared up, and then you have to kind of get the machine going up all over again. And there, I'm, I'm 40 now, so I was like, I don't know if I can just like rally the troops again to get this all going. So having uh, a community of friends around you um, that, that support you and that understand uh, your disease, I have to be, there's no separating my illness from my, my life, they are intertwined. Um, uh, going to school and, and pursuing my master's degree in psychology really helped. Um, and then there are also, sometimes I don't leave the house for a week because I can't, I'm just in too much pain. Yeah. And I, the depression part of it uh, is, is an extra, I think an extra disease, it's an extra comorbidity and should be treated as such. It's not, oh, I'm sick, so I'm depressed. It's like, no, this is, I'm, this is real depression. And that word has sort of been de demystified a little. It's lost its, we use it so much, we threw it around, throw it around so loosely when. Which is great, right? Like on one hand, we're using the word depression more often. 
that's good. Yeah. We're like acknowledging that there's these like negative feelings that are more than just feeling down in the dumps, that right. there can be a clinical implication, that there might be treatments that need to be looked yes. into, that there's something here that needs attention. Someone asked me how I best advocate, and I said it's by staying alive. Because that's, I have to show up in the world in, with the fullness of who I am, no matter what I'm feeling. And a lot of the time it doesn't look pretty. It does, it's not the perfect package. It's, it's, not, it's, it's messy a lot of the time. And that's real. And uh, we, we don't have a billboard. There's no billboard saying, this is what this disease looks like, or you're going to know what this disease is like, and this is how you should treat this person. So we have to kind of be the living billboards until there is one for us. And, and I appreciate additionally how, uh, as a woman in entertainment, uh, the, it's hard enough to not show up feeling your best self, as you're mm -hmm. saying, and, and then you know, how you're feeling and how people are perceiving you, and that has its own. Yeah. But then as a, as, a, as a woman in entertainment, that has a whole other cascade of considerations. So kudos yeah. to you for like, really owning yeah. <laughs> that. Like, look, this is just where I'm at, at today. And, and that actually transitions nicely into the last thing I want to ask you about, um, the role of comedy in mm -hmm. your life. So how have you used comedy as, and I very much so appreciate that with a lot of what I do. So yeah. as a coping mechanism, as a therapeutic tool, as a teaching tool, how has comedy been of use for you and for you in order to make an impact on others? I mean, it's saved me. So after I had my intestines removed, I um, started doing stand-up. And all of my stand-up revolves around... <laughs> which, which, by yeah. the way, funny sentence yeah. right there. So after, after I got... My intestines removed. I started doing stand-up because it's obviously the natural trajectory. Um, <laughs> so, and a lot of it is about my arthritis and living with it. And the insane testing that you have to go through to get to a diagnosis and then everyone acts like it's normal they, they're real it's really invasive and I'm a, I'm a I'm a woman and I like to think with some dignity <laughs> and you know so just bringing the to light that really intrusive atrocities that are that are we're forced to go through I'm putting them in a comedic way uh, in, in my set and also talking about the opioid crisis and how it affects chronically ill people mm -hmm. and how it's a completely different narrative and you know just in a f but doing it in a funny way you know like say they're all out there but I'm like it's hard to get um, I'd like some names and numbers <laughs> you know so just and so whenever I do a set um, I always have people come up to me and, and ask me okay oh, can, I, can you get in touch with my sister or, or a brother who has lupus or some inflammatory disease? And I started um, something called Comedy for a Cure with the Arthritis National Research Foundation. And we have a great list of comics and all of the money goes to um, yeah, grants for scientists who are doing cutting edge research and it's, it starts the, uh, it's an initial funding for their labs. So where, where is there more information about that? It's cure, it's uh, curearthritis.org. Curearthritis.org, that yeah. sounds like a cool, uh, how long has that been going on? Well, we'll be on our second year, and then I um, did, was the patient speaker last year, and I emceed the event this year, and I'm particularly drawn to that organization because all of their money goes toward research for the disease. So sure. I don't want an expensive new Band-Aid, I want a cure. <laughs> You know, I, one of my drugs was $32,000 for one shot a month, and I needed two. It's like, I, I'm grateful for this, but like, Enbrel came out in 1995. Amgen, like, we need to, let's go. We, we need something else. Let's keep this moving. Sure, sure. And it's by speaking, you know, being vocal about that, that kind of helps keep things moving. No, I went into Amgen and I told him that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll yes. do it too. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a way to make it impact. <laughs> it's like, come in and do a talk, and then I ended it with, no more expensive Band-Aids. We need cure. Let's go. <laughs> uh, what's one thing looking down the road just a little bit? So we know in, in the hemophilia world, in the hemophilia B world in particular, there have been some great advancements in medication. There are some great... Uh, or a promising, we should say, clinical trials being conducted right now. There's a lot of reason to be hopeful and excited and interested. What's something as you look three to five years down the road that you're looking forward to, whether it's for the community at large or for yourself? Um, yeah, like in three to five years, um, I think I would like to picture my boys just, uh, <laughs> this is kind of hard, uh, doing what they, what they dream they can do with maybe some newer medications out there that will allow them to to 
achieve goals that they probably never th thought that they could because of um, mom said, eh, you probably might want to rethink that or something or what the community or doctors have said that they couldn't do. Yeah, so I guess my dream is to see them um, flourish because of who they are, not for what they have. So thank you for sharing openly. You know, I do genuinely believe that when people like you guys have the courage to sit in, on stage with microphone and cameras and share openly, it normalizes other people's experiences and it lets them know they're not alone in the world. So thank you for facilitating that. And thank you to the coalition for, for having us here. Um, again, poweringthrough.org. This is the 27th conversation like this. We have videos and podcasts of the other ones if you like what you saw here today. If you do have time to fill out that quick survey to just kind of reflect for us, give us a reflection of ourselves and let us know how the Powering Through program is doing. Um, and thank you to NCHS as always for enabling this and keeping this going. Uh, really appreciate that. That, oh, Colby, you're in the back. So you can go to Colby in the back with those surveys. She's waving, she's friendly, generally speaking. She's friendly, she's always friendly. Um, and she can also help you if you have questions about podcasts or how to engage with content that we're creating from these. Uh, Colby can also assist you with that. All right, thank you very much. That's the end of the program. To watch video from any of our previous Powering Through sessions, visit poweringthrough.org. Or to learn more about National Cornerstone Healthcare Services, NCHS, visit nchswecare.com.